Welcome to another episode of New Atlas Live. I'm Brian Berletic. Joining me as always is Angelo Giuliano. Today we're going to talk more about Taiwan, uh, how the situation is in, uh, evolving after U.S. Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan uh, against the warnings of Beijing. Uh, out of one side of her mouth claiming the United States represents, you know, the one China policy, and we'll explain that once again uh, during this episode, uh, but also clearly violating the one China policy by being in Taiwan. So, uh, Angelo, a lot has kind of happened since since her visit. There's been a few developments. Uh, from from your perspective, how are things looking as as someone who lives in China and who has been to Taiwan? Uh, how how is this looking recently? It is not looking good. We we need to to look at the long term plan. Uh, really, there, there's lots of people uh, speeches. Even Pelosi, she's saying, "Well, uh, I abide to the one China policy and so on." But in reality, we need to look at acts, actions. You know, I, I'm just going to give you an example, just to the parallel with Ukraine. Uh, how many times the U.S. and the collective West has, has said, "Well, Ukraine is never going to enter into NATO." And then from 2014 to 2022, you had those army bases that are, you know, this old buildup of the military in Ukraine. And the fact that Ukraine is in NATO, is an extension of NATO, it's probably one of the, the strongest NATO army in Europe. But you see, you know, the difference between the speeches and the action. Well, that is the same with Taiwan. How, you know, how are you respected the one China policy when you actually preparing a Taiwan act that in that act is completely the opposite of one China policy. You are preparing the ground for Taiwan's independence. It's extremely clear. And you and I, we've been studying those, those papers, you know, think tank papers, especially the Ryan Corporation papers. It says clearly what they want to do. Um, so, Again, you know, just uh, what China is doing is, you know, it's very clear. There's a white paper right now that is being issued by the CPC, and it's clearer than ever. Of course, the they would rather have a peaceful reunification, but they are very clear. If it doesn't happen, if they are, if the DPP, because it's not only the U.S. crossing the red lines, it's the DPP the pro-independence party of Taiwan, which is, you know, we, we know, you, I mean, we, we've studied this, you know, it's been backed, propped up by the U.S., supported, you know, and Taiwan, she's an agent of the U.S. Remember, we exposed those uh, those uh, 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 cables from uh, WikiLeaks. Yeah. In, in, in 2004, 2005, she was having secret meetings with AIT. She was feeding them on internal politics, you know, Taiwan's politics, internal politics in DPP, uh, everything, she was giving them information and so on. So she was already de facto a U.S. agent. So we have now in Taiwan, you know, you, you have a, a, a democracy that, that has been hijacked because in reality, what she's doing is going against their own constitution. The constitution of Taiwan is very clear. Taiwan is part of China. There's one China. It is extremely clear. So whenever she's pushing the boundaries and she's going towards uh, independence, separatism, that's going, that's illegal. And the Kuomintang, they're always pointing out that what she's doing is illegal. So you see, uh, so the, I'm, I'm very worried about the trend. And again, you know, it's not going to get any better. I mean, you have this young generation, you know, since 2006, Taiwan has books. They're teaching kids that Taiwan's history started in 1949 when you had the Kuomintang that, that was losing the war against the communists and left to Taiwan. So you have this yeah. generation of kids. They grew up with books telling them we have a Taiwanese identity and our history started in 1949. We are not part of these three, 4,000 years of ancient Chinese history. So you see the trend is going to get worse and worse. And China, know, they know that. And, and again, they've been preparing you know, uh, for, for war. For, you know, uh, they've been focusing on that. And that's existential when it comes to China. Yeah. Uh, so that, those are a lot of good points that you brought up. A, a really good, quick overview of what's going on. For people who don't know, 
I, I, I feel like we have to keep repeating this, even though I, I, I know many in our audience are already familiar with this. You know, what is the one China policy? Brian, Angelo, you said Taiwan's not a country. How could that be? You know, it's, it, it's that's the truth. It is not a country. And I want to show people real quick before we get in, into any more of what's going on right now. I want to show you this. This is the, uh, February 27th, 1972. The, the one China policy the U.S. itself recognizes signed, signed communiques with, with China, with Beijing, the People's Republic of China in Beijing. And uh, they, they say it very, very clearly. So on, on this one right here, if you uh, go to this and you read it, it says the U.S. side declared the United States acknowledges that all Chinese on either side of the Taiwan Strait maintain there is but one China and that Taiwan is part of China. The United States government does not challenge that position. It reaffirms its interest in a peaceful settlement of the Taiwan question by the Chinese themselves. With this prospect in mind, it affirms the ultimate objective of the withdrawal of U.S. forces, and military installations from Taiwan. In the meantime, it will progressively reduce its forces and military installations on Taiwan uh, as the tension in the area diminishes. And this was because the United States had thousands of troops, U.S. troops stationed in Taiwan. They were pretending that Taiwan was, uh, you know, a, a country. Uh, well, not that it was a country. Actually, they were recognizing it as the legitimate government of all of China. And Angelo, you mentioned the, the Taiwanese constitution. Well, the Republic of China constitution, it sees Taiwan as part of greater China. And the Republic of China is the government of all of China, which we can all agree on uh, right now. That is ridiculous. There's no way the Republic of China in Taipei is the government of all of China. There's many aspects of Taiwan island itself that the Republic of China has little or no control over, such as their their airspace and the, the, the waters around Taiwan, as we saw recently with these Chinese exercises. Now, let's talk about the exercises a little bit. Oh, but let, let me just put this up here too, just real quick. Again, we've, we've gone over this many times and I, I don't want to be repetitive, but I still have people asking me, you know, how how is it that Taiwan is not a country. It isn't. And this is the U.S. State Department. And it says we do not support Taiwan independence. It's clear as day, black and white. They do, they do, they do not recognize Taiwan as an independent country because it is not. Uh, so I hope that clears things up. Even according to the United States, it is not an independent country. So now Nancy Pelosi did not listen to Beijing when Beijing said, do not go to Taiwan. We, we do not authorize this trip. If you go there, you're violating our sovereignty. You're threatening our national security. Just like if an official from China invited themselves to somewhere in the United States without Washington's approval, uh, that would be seen as a huge uh, violation of American sovereignty, would not be tolerated for a moment. A lot of people were worried. A Angela, you remember the lead up to Nancy Pelosi's trip. Uh, people were thinking, you know, maybe this is going to be World War III. Maybe this is going to be another war. Uh, we have a war going on in Ukraine. Maybe this will be a new war over Taiwan. Uh, but she landed. She did her trip. And China China didn't do anything. They didn't intercept her plane. They didn't try to shoot it down. Uh, they didn't sink any U.S. ship nearby. What, did it, what they did was they waited for Nancy Pelosi to leave. And they conducted these military exercises. And I remember when they first started, people were portraying them as a tantrum thrown by Beijing. Oh, they couldn't stop Nancy Pelosi, so they're gonna do these military exercises as, as like a throwing a tantrum because they're upset. But in actuality, it was very well thought through. They, they planned these quite extensively. And what the West now collectively understands is that this is China pushing back against the US. Years of incrementally subverting Chinese sovereignty over Taiwan, China is now doing the opposite, incrementally reasserting its sovereignty over Taiwan. They crossed the, the medium line in the, the strait. Uh, they flew drones over islands claimed by Taiwan, and their ships came right up to the shores of this island, Taiwan. And they were you know, simulating a, a landing, but they were also de facto cutting off sea and air traffic to Taiwan. So now the, the West understands this. They're becoming much more serious. Uh, Angela, how do you see these military exercises, the, the reaction of the West to them? Well, it was to be expected. Uh, again, they're flying, they're ultimately they're flying to their own territory. I mean, 
again, you know, China, the one China policy is, is, uh, is accepted at, uh, internationally uh, at the UN level. Um, so, so ultimately, uh, this, you know, it's still, it is <laughs> probably more Chinese territory than, 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 than the US territory, and it's, it's Chinese internal affair. Again, I just want to point out, uh, there's a, the trend, I need to be transparent about this, the trend when it, it comes to public opinion in Taiwan has been going towards independence, but extremely important, when they conduct those polls, they say clearly, do you want independence now? Do you want independence but keep the status quo? Do you want reunification? Do you want reunification and keep the status quo? And you know what they want? At 90%, over 90%, they, no matter if they want independence or not, they want to keep the status quo. Why? Because leaving the status quo would mean war. Again, Absolutely. you know, it's one thing to have the wish. You know, you, you have, uh, I mean, Los Angeles, you know, probably Los Angeles, they, they'd rather be on their own. Let's say, let's say, well, but that's a wish. That's one thing. But, you know, do the rest of the country would accept that? I mean, no, no, it's impossible. It's the same for Taiwan. So when they conduct those polls, they clear, very clear those polls. And those are Taiwanese polls. It's not like, you know, Taiwanese government polls. It's very clear, even though there's a trend that people would rather, you know, there's building this new Taiwanese identity. But when you look at Taiwan, you know, where do Taiwanese come from? They all came from the mainland, you know, and they, there's an integration of, you know, economy and so on. But, but then and, uh, you see, they want the status quo. And then we need to ask the question, who planted the idea, you know? Just this identity, this new... The, this new identity Taiwanese. I used to live in Taiwan 25 years ago. I'd ask Taiwanese, overwhelming majority, everybody would say, I am Chinese. We share the same culture. So, yeah, you, you're showing here National Endowment yeah. for Democracy. You know, the, the, just to remind people, National Endowment for Democracy is just an extension of the CIA. So what the National Endowment for Democracy is doing now is what the CIA was doing covertly, you know, uh, regime change. Yeah, and these these three links that I'm showing, this is uh, the U.S. National Endowment for Democracy talking about the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy in Taipei, and what it what it is is it's a franchise. It's it's the NED's local office in in Taiwan, and the you just asked who's planting the idea of Taiwan independence in the minds of of young people in Taiwan. It's the National Endowment for Democracy. It's Washington. We, we've talked about this also at, at great length. Uh, the economy of Taiwan is already more or less integrated with the rest of China. And if it were to declare independence, its economy would be destroyed. And there's nothing that the United States can do to, to stop that if it were to happen. It's just like Ukraine in 2014. Uh, they got their client regime into power in Kiev and they started irrationally cutting their ties with Russia, which completely destroyed their economy. And there was no coming back from that was no alternative that the West had available for Ukraine to, to replace all of the markets and cooperation it was doing with Russia. And the same goes for Taiwan with China, but just on a, such, such a much larger level because Taiwan is essentially part of China. Now, something else people were asking me, I, I want to talk a little more about the, these exercises, the military exercises. People say, Brian, if Taiwan is really a part of China, like you say, and not, not just what I say, but international law, the U.S. government uh, even says on their own State Department website. Uh, but if Taiwan is really part of China, how come China couldn't stop Nancy Pelosi from from landing? Well, uh, it's it's like how the United States can illegally invade Iraq or Syria. They can do these things. It doesn't mean that international law doesn't apply. It just means that the U.S. is breaking international law. That's all that means. It's not. It's not a demonstration of how Taiwan is not part of China. But if you want to use that logic, well, look at these military exercises China has been conducting ever since. They're flying drones over islands that Taiwan claims. They cross the medium line. They're off the shores of Taiwan. Now, if Taiwan is not part of China, how come they can't do anything to stop China from doing that? And, and, and so if you use that logic, you're going to find yourself painted into a corner. Uh, you need to look at the reality, the what what it says under international law, and what it says in all of these bilateral agreements that almost every nation on earth has made with, with Beijing. 
and that is that Taiwan is part of China. And e even the people who recognize the Republic of China, they don't recognize Taiwan, the island, as a country. They recognize the Republic of China as the one sole legitimate government of all of China. And a lot of countries were coerced into doing this. We talked about the Solomon Islands uh, kind of recently. For the longest time, the Solomon Islands recognized the Republic of China as the sole legitimate government of China, but this was killing them economically. They, they, they were not getting any sort of developmental help from the West. Their only hope was with uh, having a constructive relationship with China, and they couldn't do that without recognizing the People's Republic of China in Beijing's sole legitimate government of China. So this is, this is what's playing out. Uh, Taiwan and the United States put a lot of pressure on the Solomon Islands and the few remaining countries that still recognize the Republic of China. Angela, do you know any other countries off the top of your head that still recognize the, the Republic of China? Just I, a I few like this, islands. Yeah, Just a few small. islands. I, I yeah. think the last one that sh that shifted was Nicaragua. I think uh, to my you know, but but now it's extremely marginal. And the the yeah. you know there's a recognition just because because you know the the paycheck Taiwan's paycheck, but it's not working a anymore. Again, just why why would you, why would you go for Taiwan? I mean, just right now the 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 largest economy in the world in purchasing power parity is China. You know, so yeah. so Taiwan doesn't have the weight it used to. Um, I, I just want to point out one thing which is really important. The joint community, the foundation of the relationship between China and the US is the relationship with Taiwan. And it was extremely clear from the beginning when there was a shift of recognition from of, of China, you know, it went from Taiwan being the representative of China to China and the mainland to be the sole representative of China in face of the world. Since then, the US was not supposed to have any diplomatic relationship. So this is why they're so angry at the visit of Pelosi, Nancy Pelosi, she's number three, you know, she's second in line after Joe Biden. Uh, even though they're saying, well, this is a private visit, it is not, it is clearly it not. Yeah. Then one thing which is really important, why there's no embassy, US embassy in Taiwan is very clear. They have uh, an office called the AIT, American Institute of Taiwan, and that is because they cannot have diplomatic relationship. That is very clear. Uh, and it's been clear all along. So now what the US is doing, because you see, China has been closing an eye on many things when it came to the US, the war on terror and so on. They, you know, it was like always keeping neutral as long as the US would go along and respect the one China policy. Now the gloves are off. I wouldn't be surprised, you know, that one day that China is going to ship armament to the to Russia and be much more aggressive, you know, because China, you know now now the gloves are the gloves are off, and and yeah. I want to point out one thing I mentioned before is a lot of people are seeing this visit of Pelosi as a setback, maybe not. This setback might become an opportunity for China. And now by doing those exercises, they might create what we call a fait accompli. Fait accompli, it's like you, you start having those exercises and you put your hand, you know, you, you control of the area around Taiwan. And it's a fait accompli. You want to send aircraft carrier like they did, they did uh, under Clinton? It's not going to work this time. This is all, 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 all turf. You don't come into all, you know, all, it's a matter of national security you know, national sovereignty. Uh, so I do think that this actually might become an opportunity for China. Yeah, actually, that's a very good point. I, I was actually thinking along the same lines that a lot of people were saying, oh, Beijing's just throwing a tantrum because they couldn't stop Nancy Pelosi. But, it, but as a matter of fact, they had been planning this and they were looking for an excuse. They knew the U.S. was going to continue with these provocations. They know Nancy Pelosi wasn't doing it. She came on a U.S. Air Force jet. So how is that a private visit. Uh, it was it was clearly a state visit. Uh, just before the show, you were talking about uh, the ambiguity of U.S. foreign policy regarding Taiwan, because they're talking out of both sides of their mouth. They're saying, we respect the one China policy, and yet Nancy Pelosi is standing in Taiwan uh, at, at, in violation of uh, Beijing's authorization. So this is a big opportunity for China. Like I said, they were crossing all of these lines. These were not official lines. These were lines that Beijing recognized simply to avoid escalation. 
the you know the conjured up air defense identification zone of Taiwan, which actually extends over Fujian pr province on mainland China, is completely ridiculous. Uh, but but China more or less uh, um, respected them. They didn't recognize them, but they respected them to avoid escalation. All of that is over. They're crossing all of these lines. They don't they don't recognize them. They never did, and now they're not even going to respect them if the if the United States and the De Democratic Progressive Party in Taipei want to play this game, China will play it with them and China will win. A lot of people were extremely disappointed that China didn't do something more forceful to stop Nancy Pelosi. They said, this is a huge embarrassment to China. Uh, you know, Russia standing up to the US, uh, Taiwan or China is not. And I understand that it was very frustrating. I mean, even myself personally, I, I don't want to see war, but I, I also don't want to see a nation being humiliated within its own territory. So you, you kind of hoped that China would do something to teach the U.S. a lesson. But these exercises are actually doing that in, in a much more significant way. And I just want to kind of show uh, some of the reaction from the West more recently. At first, they were writing it off as a tantrum, but uh, U.S. hits out on irresponsible China amid attack, attack rehearsal claims. What about the U.S. being irresponsible, violating China in violation of their own bilateral agreements and, and international law? What about that? Uh, Taiwan says more drones approached its outer islands. Right. Well, so this is China just flying drones straight over these islands, Taiwan claims. How about this one from Bloomberg? Pelosi says U.S. can't let China establish new normal on Taiwan. What does that mean? New normal on Taiwan. That means... <laughs> the Chinese military operating anywhere it wants in and around so-called Taiwanese territory. That's what the new normal is. And that is what China is establishing right now. Uh, let's see if, do I got anything written down for this article? Uh, Angela, you got any thoughts? Well, hold on. Let me yeah. read this real quick. Mm -hmm. Please. Um, so this is Nancy Pelosi. What we saw with China is they were trying to establish sort of a new normal, Pelosi said. And we just can't let that happen. The drills held by China in response to Pelosi's visit shrank a vaguely defined buffer zone that had long helped keep the peace around Taiwan, which Beijing views as part of its own territory. And, and let me add and remind people, the whole world views it that way. Uh, on Wednesday, the People's Liberation Army Command, responsible for the Taiwan Strait, said that it had successfully completed all tasks set out in the exercises and would regularly organize patrols in the area. So yes, they're establishing a new normal. What is your thoughts on this, Angelo? What do you think about that new normal? Again, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of uh, what is it doing, just this visit of Pelosi, what is going to, to, to happen for Taiwanese economy? What if you are an investor, you have invested massively into Taiwan's economy, Taiwan overnight has become unstable. So now the risk of Taiwan has become so high. If you're an investor, what do you do? You get out of Taiwan. That's what you do. Now you have investor confidence go, is going lower. Now you have companies that are starting to ask themselves, where do I move my production? And then you see the microchip, you know, this is the, this is the pearl of the industry of, when it comes to Taiwan. It's the high tech, is the pride of Taiwan. They are starting to build, you know, to transfer this technology outside of Taiwan, they are talking about, you know, the US, Arizona, big plants being built there. What is it doing to Taiwan's economy? You, so now you, we are in a process of uh, maybe the beginning of a disindustrialization of Taiwan. You already have 2 million Taiwanese that are, they move to the mainland because of job opportunity, because it's booming there. They have higher salary and, and you have the biggest brains, you know, of Taiwan. They left most of them to China, some of them to the US. Now you are accelerating this trend. So in five years time, where Taiwan is going to be, if they keep on going this way, if they start having confrontation with China, China is gonna purchase less, is gonna punish economically. And it, it they did start, they, they stopped export you know, exporting sand from China, which they need for the uh, semiconductor industry, and they're buying less fish and other products. That's the beginning. Now you see, you know, this industrialization of Taiwan, I mean, where are we going? 
Look at what happened to Ukraine. Where is Ukraine now? How does it benefit Taiwanese? And you see, Taiwan is going against the will of the people. That's not what Taiwanese want. What Taiwanese want at an overwhelming majority is stability. But you see how sometimes those politicians hijack their own democracy. Same as Zelensky. Zelensky had told Ukrainians 73% of people, they voted for him. For why? Because he wanted to tackle uh, corruption and he wanted to make peace with Donbass. So 73% of Ukrainians, they wanted peace with Donbass. You ask the same to Taiwanese, they want peace with the mainland. They, that's what they want. Now you have Taiwan, which is going against not only the constitution of Taiwan, but against the will of Taiwanese people. Because you ask Taiwanese people, no matter if they want to have that Taiwanese identity, what they want is peace with, with China. Yeah. And and again, think about this too. I mean, because because China can see what the U.S. is doing regarding Taiwan and the possibility for you know computer chip manufacturing to be disrupted, they're investing heavily on the mainland to do their own chip manufacturing. The United States knows they're going to feed Taiwan into a, a proxy war feet first, and so they're investing in domestic chip production back in the United States. They're pulling the economic rug out from under Taiwan all while encouraging them to continue down this self-destructive uh, uh, road. And just like you said, it's exactly it's exactly like Ukraine. Now, uh, here are some more articles. Al Jazeera, I mean, from my perspective, Al Jazeera is the BBC Qatar edition. I mean, it, it is very pro-Western in a lot of ways. And uh, they're saying China's new normal for Taiwan raises fears for global trade. And I, I keep hearing this, that Oh, Ch China's reckless actions are disrupting trade in the region. It's it's China's trade. It's trade by them to other countries and other countries trading with China. China is the, their largest trade partner. Um, almost across the entire region, China is the largest trade partner for, for other Asian countries. So it's actually the United States interfering around Taiwan that is causing this. Now, here's what I wanted to get to this New York Times article. U.S. insists it will operate around Taiwan despite... China's pressure. So they're not done with Pelosi. Everyone said Pelosi did it on her own. Uh, this is the United States as a whole, as a, as a government, as a military, confirming that this is all part of the same uh, foreign policy. And they're just pretending that it's all compartmentalized uh, for plausible deniability. But this is the U.S. government and military saying they're going to continue pushing this issue. So what is what does this New York Times article say? It says administration officials said uh, now, let's skip to this part. Within a few weeks, officials said the U.S. Navy is planning to run ships through the Taiwan Strait, ignoring China's recent claim that it controls the entire waterway. Officials said they would not send the Ronald Reagan uh, uh, aircraft carrier, the Japan-based aircraft carrier, because it would be too provocative. Now, uh, and, and then, Angela, I want to know what, what you think will happen. But I personally think China will allow this to happen and they will use it as a, as another excuse to expand their ongoing military operations around Taiwan. Uh, we're going to get into a paper. And I also saw in the Global Times, which I think more or less reflects Beijing's thinking that this is going to continue until Taiwan is fully reunified with China. These military exercises triggered by Nancy Pelosi and then they will be sustained by constant U.S. provocations uh, like this transit of the Strait. Angela, what do you think about that? I think uh, for China, it's it's not a bad thing that it's exposing uh, this ambiguity that uh, the U.S. is doing. They're signing agreement and they're not respecting them. I mean, it's not the first time, you know, JCPOA, the Paris yeah. Agreement. Uh, they, they keep on breaking accords, you know, uh, same as Minsk agreement. We we learned recently, you know, Poroshenko said clearly that they signed the agreement they were never meant to re respect, it was to buy time. The same, the same with China all along, it was signing agreement. And so for China, it's a way to prepare for the time uh, di diplomatically. China is getting support. You even have allies, U.S. allies, that are saying that the visit of Pelosi was a huge mistake, was a huge provocation. and was no need to do that. I mean, especially now, think about it. The way there's a, already uh, a, a war in Ukraine. It's a, the world is getting very unstable. 
you, know, you have uh, energy prices, uh, you know, skyrocketing, inflation. You have the global south that uh, you know they, they, you know, f they might be have a uh, food shortages. Uh, lots of countries are going to get bankrupt because of the you know the, the overall ec economy, global economy is going down. Why? do this right now and again you know it's not it's not that china hasn't repeatedly said don't do that it, it, you know it, it, it reminds me of putin for eight years eight years you have putin telling you know the the g7 the collective west don't cross the red lines it's very clear don't cross the red lines how many times you have to say it and then and, and then you, and then they realize wait it's, the putin is not bluffing you see, if uh, China is even less bluffing, I want to point out one thing. China, keep in mind, if you look at history, China took on three nuclear power. They fought India. In the 60s, they fought India and the USSR. They fought the US in Korea. Do you think now that China is not going to have a direct confrontation with the U.S., especially here, we are touching Taiwan. You know, in, in Chinese constitution, if we, it's in, in the, the, the constitution that Taiwan needs to be reunited with the mainland. By law, China needs to go to war if, if, they, if it cannot get Taiwan back. So if, if for one second people think that China is bluffing, <laughs> no, no, they are serious. And you talk, it's not only, you know, we're not even talking about the CPC. We are talking about the people in the streets. People in the street are more nationalistic than the CPC. CPC is well measured. People in the street, they yeah. go nuts because, because it's very deep in the DNA of Chinese. It's a hundred years of humiliation. Getting back Taiwan would end this huge humiliation that Chinese have. It's in their DNA. It's so deep inside. So the alternative, I mean, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't want to bet on that, but, you know, it, it's not looking good. It's, to me, it seems like more not uh, if there is war, but when. Yeah, well, that, that is what a lot of people uh, in U.S. military and policy circles are saying. Also, I just wanted to point this out. Actually, I think, Angelo, you're the one that pointed this out to me. Uh, the Taiwan question and China's reunification in the new era. This is a, a white paper published on the State Council Information Office's website of the People's Republic of China. And they're making it crystal clear that this, this reunification is going to happen. It is going to happen. They would like for it to happen peacefully. They're doing it through economic means primarily. And we already see the, the integration of Taiwan's economy with the rest of China. That has already been ongoing for years and years. And after the US pulls the carpet out from under Taiwan economically by moving chip production to the United States, where is Taiwan going to turn? Who, who cares about Taiwan and will actually help Taiwan it'll be mainland China. It, it, it always was, it always will be mainland China. Uh, so uh, maybe I'm going to put the link to this in the comment section in case people are interested in reading this. I'll put it in the video description. You know, after, after this uh, goes up on my channel, I will. So it's in the comment section. A Angela, how much of this did you read? And uh, I mean, from your point of view, I think you've already pretty much said it. Uh, like, how serious do you think China is about reunifying? Well, they Taiwan? they need to, to put it in black and white. They need to tell the yeah. you know they, they've been repeating this for I mean since 1949. You know, over and over. You know, it's a existential for China. Now they put need to put this in in black and white. Again, what China is saying, it's very clear. We favor peaceful reunification. We offer Taiwan a, a, a solution which would be one country, two system. So you keep your political system. Actually, it's it's not nothing changes. Actually, they they propose to Taiwan. You keep your democracy. We are not going to send people from the Beijing to Taiwan. You, but you can actually send political representative from Taiwan to be to represent Taiwan within China, and then you can even keep your armed forces. So in reality, 
nothing would change. It would be a one country, two system. It's a matter of faith. If people understand about China, Chinese history and Chinese, it's a matter of faith. They need to keep this faith, but ultimately nothing would change. Nothing, absolutely yeah. nothing. But it's the same as uh, the handover of Hong Kong to China. In reality, what, what happened? Nothing changed. It went into a mess in 2019 because they instigated, you know, the uh, foreign foreign powers, and especially the US, they instigated a color revolution, same as in Maidan. Yeah. Again, nothing would happen. You know, what they did in, in, in Hong Kong in 2019, they did in 2014 in Taiwan. Remember, we, 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 we covered that, the, the Sunflower Revolution. When the relationship was getting really, they were getting very close. They were about to, to sign um, a, a trade agreement between Taiwan and China. And then you had the Sunflower Revolution. Those kids that grew up with the, the new books of a new Taiwanese identity, we are super, superior. You know, it's, it's, it's the same as the history books you had in Hong Kong, where you, they made feel the Hong Kong people as being superior. And you had those Taiwanese a bit looking down, you know, these new kids looking down at China. Oh, you know, we got this idea of C CPC, oh, the, the bad guy, you know, just, a, oh, you know, it's a generation that grew up with Netflix. And then yeah. when you have saying when, she's talking about all Western values. Can you imagine? How ridiculous is that? Always, <laughs> where, where is Taiwan looking? You know, you know, it's not because you you allow to have gay marriage in 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 Taiwan that it makes makes Taiwan Western. It, it, it's not. And you go to Taiwan. I, I believe me. Sometimes Taiwan can be even more traditional than than China, in many ways. You know, and you know what else? I mean, uh, it's it's the colonial mindset. Uh, Tsai Ing Wen and the Democratic Progressive Party. They they their minds have been colonized by the United States. And when they talk, they don't even think about how ridiculous it is. The things that they're saying, like saying that Taiwan is is Western. You're right off the coast of China. You're on the other side of the planet from the West. You're you're not a Western country, and you never will be. You're you're uh you know, you're serving Western interests, that, that that's about it. And, uh, you know, to ordinary people, this must sound completely crazy. And unfortunately, people that are growing up in that environment, they, to them, it'll see, seem very, very normal. Now, the, the thing you were talking about, Hong Kong, and, you know, the, the one country, two systems, and a lot of, a lot of people will say, well, Brian, Angelo, isn't it, you know, didn't, didn't China prove that they're going to crack down and, and erase all of this? Uh, isn't that what happened with Hong Kong? No, that's not what happened. Hong Kong still has its own system. It's just been cleared of foreign interference. The United States was directly meddling in Hong Kong's system. You cannot claim that you have a, a democratic system with elections uh, on the path towards self-determination if the United States is interfering in everything that you're doing. If they have influence over everything you're doing, that is foreign interference. That is not democracy. It's foreign interference uh, with with voting and elections to make it look like something other than foreign interference, but it's still foreign interference. And it is the exact same process uh, taking place in Taiwan. I just posted someone's comment on the screen a, a couple of moments ago that Taiwan never had democracy. And I, I think that's true. Taiwan was never calling the shots, the, the, the government, the people, they were not calling their own shots. They were always a vector of U.S. interests vis-a-vis -vis China. That's all it ever was. That's all it is right now. And until China reunifies Taiwan with the rest of China, that's what it will continue to, to be. Um, let's see. Uh, we're at 40 minutes just about. Uh, if you have questions, start posting your questions now. If we see relevant, interesting questions, we'll try to... We'll try to answer, do our best to answer them. Uh, I, th I think that China is going to continue this incremental process. I think they're, go they're going to try to avoid conflict as much as possible for as long as possible with the United States. They know time is on their side. China's economy and military grows stronger every single year. The United States grows weaker every single year, relative, relatively speaking. Uh, so they don't they don't want a conflict. It's the United States that's desperate to make something happen here because they are out of time. And we're kind of seeing the same thing happen 
in regards to U.S. efforts to uh, encircle and contain Russia over Ukraine. That is turning out terribly for the United States and its allies. I think it's going to be even worse with Taiwan. Someone else posted a comment uh, during this stream saying, you know, the U.S. cannot ship weapons to Taiwan like they're shipping weapons to Ukraine. And by the way, these weapons are shipping to Ukraine may be prolonging the conflict, but it's not going to change the, the inevitable fact that Ukraine the, the current regime, they are going to lose this conflict. And it'll be even worse for Taiwan because it's an island. They, you know, the Chinese military proved how easy it is to just cut them off uh, from sea and air. Uh, how is the U.S. going to support Taiwan? Uh, their military, the, the people in the streets, are they going to stand up and fight? Do they have? Uh, Angela, you've, you've been to Taiwan, you live in China. Does Taiwan have you know, a segment of the population that is fanatical, like the Nazis in Ukraine? No, absolutely not. It's one thing to to like the idea of independence because that, that, that is what they, they want. You know, it's, they like the idea of independence, but they know that independence is not even a remote possibility. What saddens me in this whole history story is, uh, is when you look at Ukraine, you have the U.S. that is actually fighting against Russia to the last Ukrainian, but maybe up to the last European. With Taiwan, they want to fight China to last Taiwanese, if not enough to the last Japanese. Keep in mind that Japan is actually a very key element in the whole equation, because the only way that, that really the US could contain China is by using Japan. And you see Japan has been hijacked democracy. You know, yeah, LDP has been funded. Uh, you know, there's a New York Times uh, articles in 1992. You know, it, sh it says clearly, and the LDP has been funded by the CIA. It's never been actually uh, Japan has never been a, demo a democracy. I mean, you know, just just because it's never been a sovereign state. Again, you know, uh, democracy is is about being a sovereign state. Yeah. And it's interesting that Taiwan actually is mentioning so sovereignty. When when have have you ever been sovereign state in reality? Since 1949, you've been actually a, a tool to the U.S. And I want to point out one thing. You know how they used Taiwan? At the beginning, the U.S. recognized Taiwan. And then they dropped Taiwan for China because they needed China to fight the USSR. So they, they needed China to be on their side. So they've been used once since 1949 to the 70s. You know, they've been used once and been dropped, dropped like a used condom. You had this experience. You've been through that. And now again, you are going to be used again. Don't you remember that in the 70s, they dropped you in favor of China, the CPC of China? Don't you remember that? That's your own history. I don't even need yeah. to mention Ukraine. You've gone through that. Already, yeah, and it's, the, the exact same people you know, too who did it. it, it you know, it, it reminds me. I, 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 you know, it's maybe a bad example, but you know, like a woman that is being abused, and it keeps on going back to the same man that abused her. Yeah, keep on doing the yeah. same thing and expecting different results. Don't you remember that you've been colonized by Japan? That you've been colonized since 1949. The only way you could survive was by having the assurance of the U.S. that they would protect you. They dropped yeah, and you hosting, the yeah, yeah, and, and they the were whole, hosting yeah. hosting U.S. troops uh, and and the whole the whole thing. I mean, it was de facto colonization, and it still kind of is, but it's it's muted because they had to re withdraw their troops, and they've never had the ability to send them back and. Uh, as I put in a recent video, there are people in U.S. policy circles who are talking about uh, quietly expanding the U.S. military footprint on Taiwan so that it would serve as a tripwire so that uh, China would, would not go through with an invasion in fear of triggering a war with the U.S. But as I've said, unless the U.S. wants to resort to nuclear weapons over Taiwan, uh, China has the conventional military power to uh, erase the U.S. military presence in and around Taiwan, you know, and there's very little that the U.S. could do about it. Uh, uh, let's get to some of these questions. What about foreign visits? Will China let it happen? Yes, they will, because they don't want to risk a war fought on America's terms, on America's uh, timeline. They want to, if they have to fight a conflict, they want to fight it on their own terms, on their own schedule, 
they were not they're not going to like shoot down a plane or something uh, if this continues this problem eventually china is going to have to establish signif uh, significant enough control over taiwan where they are in charge of security there that physically prevent someone from landing at the airport uh, or detain them when they arrive at the airport and send them send them out uh, angela what do yeah. you think about that i think i think china wouldn't care i mean uh you know, foreign visit for China, what is important is really the, the position of the U.S. You know, if the French president wants to go to Taiwan, well, do it, do it, but you pay the price. You see uh, the price that Australia has paid. Australia has uh, 30 to 40 percent of its trade with China. But, you know, China cut the trade. Cut, you cut the trade. No more trees going from China going to Australia as well. You know, we're going to show you that we mean business. Same as Lithuania, you know, they, they, they started to, you know, they, they renamed the, the, the Taiwan's office, representative office in Lithuania. That's it, you know, you are annihilating yourself from the largest economy in the world. Not only that, keep in mind, it's not only not trading with China, but it's also the, you know, China has the most, is the, the most support when it comes to diplomacy. Actually, when you look at Russia and China, Look at China, how they, how they treat diplomats. First thing, you know, when you have an African country going to China, they treat him as equal, equal, equal level. And then they get the same treatment back in Africa. Look at, uh, you know, Lavrov visit in Africa. He's treated like, like a star. I mean, like a star, you know, they, they love him. Not only countries, but they, they love him. You see, the U.S., it's different because the U.S. is a policy of stick. You don't obey us. Well, you know, we are going to put pressure on the, the IMF and we're not going to give you the, the loan. You yeah. don't go, you start trading not, uh, you know, like Gaddafi, you don't want to trade into US dollar. Well, we are going to overthrow you. That, that's, that's the stick. China, yeah. it's an approach of, I respect you. I'm not going to meddle. You know, I'm not meddling. You know, it's, they call it Westphalian attitude. You know, it's like, we, you, I respect your sovereignty. You deal your own thing at home and this mutual respect and, and it's equal i'm not going to yeah. teach you you know how to deal with your country with your culture and so on while you have the you know this arrogant west collective west which is going around the world and, and telling you know like ancient civilization how they should deal yeah you know again you know the collective west has a 200 years of hegemony which is an, an anomaly in Global history, it's an anomaly. It's just, it happened to be like this, but it's an anomaly and it's a very small portion of the, the world population, 10% of the world population, which is controlling the 90%. Now, well, you know, guess what? You have BRICS, BRICS 40% of the world's population and they're getting together. Uh, people that they, they thought they were, that they were enemies, well, they actually know the long-term gain. First, you know, like example, India and China. Well, you know what? We know we have a common enemy. It's first of all, imperialism. You need to be decolonized. Then we are going to set up differences. And I'm very actually surprised. You know, it's a, the best surprise. I mean, in this, in what, since what, the, the Ukraine conflict, it's actually in, in this position. But you see, there's more and more countries that are joining in. There's Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and so on. So is the U.S., you know, and, and, and the irony is that they say that they, they want to isolate China and Russia. That's the opposite that is happening. <laughs> yeah. the, the collective West is isolating itself, you know, complete isolation. Look at the map when they're voting. It's a complete divide. And then look at the trend. Where's the growth? Where's the shift of economy going? And China has been, has been helping a lot in this trend. You know, why they have invested massively in the Global South, in the Belt and Road Initiative? Well, because they want to shift the power. And this is why uh, so they're gaining actually lots of support diplomatically, because they're helping the Global South. Yeah. You, you know what it's like. It's like the, the United States is the mafia coercing everybody, giving them hard, not even really a deal. I mean, they're giving them an ultimatum. And they have to meet it under under threat of violence. And China is just doing business. And I could see this yeah. with my own eyes. I could see it here in Thailand, how 
China deals with Southeast Asia and how the U.S. deals with Southeast Asia. It, it really is like the mafia versus just a yeah. law abiding <laughs> businessman. Uh, how about this question here? What do you think of the microchip act enacted by the U.S.? I think this will marginalize TSMC as the U.S. has factored that in that Taiwan will be reunified to the motherland China. Your thoughts? Yeah, again, the, the U.S. couldn't care less about Taiwan if they tried. They are doing everything to use it down to the last man, woman, and child, and then they are going to throw the, the dried up husk of Taiwan away. They don't care about its future politically, economically, militarily. They are just using it. And when they are done, they are going to throw it away. This is what they've done to so many other proxies. Taiwan is not the exception. They will be used also. And this is part of doing it, uh, backing up what they have been exploiting Taiwan for, backing it up so that they don't need it anymore, so they can just send it through the, the wood chipper uh, like they're doing with Ukraine right now. Angelo, do you have any thoughts on this? There's an another one after this. This is a pretty good one, too. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, I heard that the... Yeah. Oh, no, yeah, go ahead. Speak. Go ahead. <laughs> no, but, you know, it's a, but look at the, the behavior around the world. You know, it's, it's about raping. It's, it's not even stealing. It's raping. You know, you, you go to Afghanistan, you destroy completely the country, and then you take $7 billion of their foreign reserve while the country is starving. You know, it's just it's yeah. ridiculous. They're stealing the oil in, in Syria. They, you yeah. know, it's just, it just, and then they come back and they say, oh, human rights, freedom, democracy <laughs> but yeah. maybe you know, but again you know the the collective west has the best marketing and you see you talk to average joe in the west they buy that they buy that because average joe is you know is in a survival mode he's got three jobs he's barely surviving every single day it's getting worse and worse and you know what his drug is is what we call the, the opium of the people is Netflix. And it, what he sees in Netflix is, is movies where, where the US is saving the world. And, and that's sadly, I don't want to look down, but that's average Joe in the West, sadly. It's ignorance, yep. pure ignorance. Yeah, and, and you know, it's the Western media and their control over people. And it's it's hard to blame ordinary people who are just trying to make ends meet. Yeah. They don't have time to exactly. research all of this. So. How about this one? I heard that the DPP closed down opposition media and have a brown sh and have brown shirt like groups that suppress protests against the DPP. Well, I know for sure that they're shutting down media, and this is all done in cooperation with with the support and backing of the United States. And the United States will continue to repeat the myth that the DPP is pro democracy. I mean, it's Democratic Progressive Party. They want to convince the world that that is exactly what the DPP is. And not that it's a, a, an authoritarian uh, political circle that the U.S. is using, hiding behind the smokescreen of promoting democracy, when in fact they're doing the exact opposite. Angela, I know you know a lot about what the DPP has done in Taiwan to clamp yes. down on alternative thought. Well, you, you know, I, I like to say that uh, Tsai Ing-wen, the, the current president Tsai Ing-wen, she got elected. She was first selected by the West before being elected by Taiwanese. So you see the selection, how do they do that? I mean, besides, you know, you know, the pouring money, you know, that support, you know, to the national and known for, the, for democracy and all those NGOs helping out in Taiwan is actually going against Taiwan's democracy. But besides that, what they did in 2015, 16, before the, she got elected, they propped her up internationally. So she was in, in, in uh, Times magazines and all the big magazines. Like she is the new miracle for Taiwan's democracy and so on. So what do Taiwanese see back home? They say, oh, you know what? She's she's the personality, personality, you know, she she's the, the one, you know, she so there's this process of selection. You see, and yeah. it's the same as when you look at you in Europe, you know the selections, how the selection work is very often those wannabe president, you know, they've been going to the right schools, the, you know, the, but then the last step is going through the Bilderberg group meetings, and then by chance, they've gone to the meeting. Next thing is that they, they got elected. So, you know, it's the, those, those, those generation like Macron. Actually, Emmanuel Valls, which was, you know, in France, was, he went through Bilderberg, and he was supposed to, to be the next candidate to be president. So, you see, there is this system of selection and then they get elected and they get elected because there's there's millions of dollars you know it's a 
when you have a democracy which which money uh, i mean you know uh, you you put money and you win because you get the right exposure that's no more democracy i'm sorry you know there's a yeah. direct correlation there's a very direct correlation between the time uh, of exposure in the media to how much percentage of votes you get it's very simple yeah. you get exposure yeah. you get you get the votes yeah, and, and in the United States, the way it works is that no matter who you vote for, these are people who serve uh, corporate yeah, yeah. finance, your special interest. So it doesn't even really matter who who you vote for because uh, they all serve the same circle of interest. Now, this is something I see all the time. Don't you think it would be better for Taiwan to be a ton an autonomous region, just what Donbass would like to be? Oh. No, I don't. You know, if... Taiwan became independent, it would be a complete disaster. It would be like Ukraine from 2014 onward. It would be a complete disaster run by extremists working for foreign interests. The Donbas uh, independence movement sprung out of US interference in Ukraine's internal political affairs. Uh, they put a regime into power in Kiev that was an anti-Russian regime. It was an anti-Russian project. The people in the Donbas speak Russian. Uh, they they see Russians as, you know, close, closely related to, to them. Uh, they have family members who are in Russia. They do not want to be part of an anti-Russian project. This is why they were seeking independence. They would have rather not have been independent. They were quite happy with a status quo where Ukraine was making, uh, rela uh, you know, business deals and a relationship with Russia and also with the West instead of irrationally cutting off Russia and becoming a battering ram for the West against Russia. This was suicidal. And we see it's literally suicidal is destroying the country. Uh, for Taiwan, it's the exact same thing. Taiwan independence is manufactured in Washington. It is divorced from the Taiwanese people, their, their best interests. Their best interests are with the rest of China, uh, soon to be the largest, most powerful economy on earth. Why, why would you not want to be a part of that? You are right there across the strait. You are recognized as part of China by every everyone on earth and under international law. Why why would you want to be independent of that? Whose interest does that really serve? Does it serve the interests of the people living there? Or does it serve Washington's interests only? And, and people who hate China, their interests are served by uh, cultivating this division between this island and the rest of China. Uh, uh, Angela, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I was in, in Hong Kong uh, during the handover in 97, and, and I saw there's absolutely no change. You know, people, they thought that the PLA would walk into Hong Kong and you, you'd have a police state. You know, for since 97, for 25 years, Hong Kong had, you know, the, in human rights freedom, you know, the Fraser in, from the Fraser Institute, which is not pro-China, it had the third position in the world, the freest place in the world, you know. So this is personal experience. What would happen in Taiwan, you know, Taiwan would have a high degree of autonomy, the same as many regions in China. You know, don't, don't, you know, it's, it's, you know, China is a huge, China is a, is a, even more than a country, it's a continent. You know, with 50 nationalities, it's extremely complex. But again, you know, there's, there's a very high degree of autonomy. Uh, so for Taiwan, if it was to go back to China, nothing would change, nothing absolutely nothing you will have a very high uh, degree of autonomy i i think that china would absolutely have to revamp security oh uh, yeah like, well, a, like a national books. security law yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that, well, that, that, no, no. that also yeah but what we're talking to... about is their political system economically actually i think economically things would change but for the better yeah uh, but as, as far as their system, what does China care if they have this yeah. type of, just like Hong Kong, they have their system. Why would the rest of China care about that as long as foreign interference was uprooted? And people will say, well, they're, they're, they are changing it because they got rid of the DPP and, and all of the aspects that they created on Taiwan. They got rid of the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy. So they are changing things. No, they're uprooting <laughs> subversion, sedition, treason. And foreign interference and and every country has a right to do that including china yeah i remember you remember we we had mentioned this uh taiwan foundation for democracy which is a sister you know sister entity from the national and for for democracy was actually funding adrian zenz you know the memorial of victim of communist adrian zenz which is the 
the main source for all the lies related to the you know what they call genocide in Xinjiang so you see I mean they you know and, and actually Taiwan has been actually meddling uh, you know they have a system of meddling into they, they're doing massive lobbying in the US but then they've been meddling those into those islands remember the disruption in Solomon Island you know where did the funding came come from a lot yeah. came from Taiwan yeah well you know what it is it's it's coming from the US and it's being laundered through Taiwan yeah, yeah. because I, exactly I mean, if, I, I mean may, I maybe I'm wrong but I just see that the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy is just an extension of US meddling absolutely and they kind of launder it through there so it doesn't look like it's just Washington doing that they're like see Taiwan's doing it also but but actually no it, it's it really yeah. is the United States and if the U US was cut out of this whole process thing think about this they have to cross an entire ocean to get to Taiwan to interfere just just that alone people should wake up and realize there's something completely wrong about all of this uh let's try to get like another question or two and then we can wrap this up because we're over an hour we we never whenever i should make it clear that um <laughs> we questions at the Q end yes yeah people because people put up questions while we're you know at the beginning and some of them are good questions and uh, we, we we really just never get to them uh, if you see a good question let me let me know if anyone has a question just uh throw it out there uh, but there's there's a lot of one one thing i do want to talk about until let, let's just get like one more question um one thing i do want to say though is people who understand they're being lied to and i i've said this many times it needs to be repeated people who understand they're being lied to by the western media about the u.s and its foreign policy in the Middle East, or the U.S. and its policy towards Russia, or the U.S. and its support of extremists in Ukraine. They understand that they're being lied to about that. But then when they talk about China, they are repeating almost verbatim U.S. State Department, White House, uh, DOD talking points. You know, China steals intellectual property. China's a big threat to us. Uh, it's the CCP. They're hiding under your bed. Uh, why? Why do, why do people fall for that? Uh, you know, why why don't they understand that they're also being lied to about that? That that is not the first thing the Western media is collectively telling the truth about. As a matter of fact, this is something that they lie about more than anything else. China. Yeah, it uh, reminds and, me. You, you know, it reminds me all those you know those people. They say. Uh, you, you tell them, oh, you, you know, you've been lied to the incubator in Kuwait. Uh, oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, you've been lied to the weapons of mass destruction. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You've been lied in, you know, the the uh, Bay of Pigs, you know, in Cuba. And, and yes, yes, yes. But in China, they they, they are killing uh, uh, Uyghurs. The Uyghurs, like, yeah. You you you've been lied so many times, and you still fucking fall for this. Sorry for the bad word. Yeah. But they, they you know, they say. It's just madness, you know. Uh, now you get those stories. People buying to in Ukraine, they buying to Russia, shelling their own prison where you have Ukrainian inside. They buy into Russia, shelling Zaporozhye, the nuclear plant, which they con Russia is controlling. Why? Yeah. I mean, even it's it's difficult. How would you shell your own land? The same as you have. Donetsk, you know, when they 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 shelling Don, Donetsk, you know, uh, they uh, Russia controlled Donetsk, and they're saying it's Russia shelling it. It's just absurd, absurd. Yeah. And people still buy into that. You've been like so many times. You still buy into the, those lies. It's it's absurd. Yeah. Um. How how about this question? I because I I've heard people and I've asked people in China. You know what what are they even talking about? Yeah. What about the tanks and the bank vids on the web? You you know what it is? There are videos on the on the internet that people are taking deliberately out of context and fooling people who for mm -hmm. some reason think that this is this they don't like a lot of people in the West just plain don't like China and I know people get throw a fit every time I say this but it is definitely because of racism. People in the West are very racist. They don't like Asian people. They don't like black people. They don't like people from the Middle East. They don't like Semitic people. They're racist. That's, I grew up in an environment like that. I saw it with my own eyes and I don't want people to say uh, that you're just repeating you know, like cultural Marxism, whatever that is. I've seen it with my own eyes. I understand that it's real. I saw it in the military. 
I've seen it everywhere. And I don't think that it's uh, been fixed since I left the United States. They're racist. They want to believe bad things about China. They don't want to believe that China, uh, the people living there are just as smart and hardworking as they are, but there's four over four times more of them. And so that they will sur surpass us. And they don't want to admit that that is possible because they're clinging to the superiority complex of their own where they are the best and no one can be better than them. And they refuse to believe that the Chinese people can do that, but they can and they are and they will. And you need to get over that. You see these videos on the internet, just do like five minutes of research. One of the bank videos, which were, you know, people going to an ATM, just like some local bank that had some problem and people were trying to get their money at. That happens in many places. You have these poorly managed small banks that get into trouble and then they end up having to, to give everyone their money back. It ha happens here in Thailand. It has happened across the West. Yeah. It's not like the entire financial system in China is collapsing, but you'll have people who hate China. They know no one's going to look into it themselves and they could use this to feed the hate. And, and they make a living doing this too. You know, like people like Tim Pool, he's on the internet with his, his guests and they come in and they just say the most ridiculous things. They know no one's going to look yeah. it up. They know people have this innate hatred toward China and they're, they're making money doing this. Uh, Angela, what do you, what about the tanks and the banks? Well, it's, it's just, uh, you know, it, they, they take, uh, I think it was, uh, uh, was it like Qingdao? There was, there was something like a defile of tanks and actually they took that. Uh, as, 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 and, and they put the put the bank story together and was was two, two unrelated story. I just want to point out, you know, there people don't know, but in China there are tens of thousands of protests every year, but for many yeah. different things. You know, it's a 1.4 billion people country, and you have the right to protest. You know, it's not illegal, and the people do. You know, if it gets violence, okay, well, you know, there's a response from the police. But I want to point out. From personal experience, 27 years now in China, police brutality, zero, zero. The police doesn't have the monopoly of, of force, usage of force. You know, it's, it's not like in the US or in, in the West. When you go to China, you will realize that actually police, they, they're there to serve you. And that's what police should be about. You know, if you hit them, then they're going to hit you back. But you, you just show me some videos of police brutality. If it's not justified, in China, police go to jail. That's for sure. That's, that is for sure. You know, especially now, you know, with social media and so on. So you see the big difference in, if I was in the US, sometimes I would be afraid of, you know, you know, just asking direction. You know, you have this arrogance coming from the police because, because they have the monopoly of, of force. And what is interesting is that I understand in, in, in the US, like people bearing arms because they don't trust the state. <laughs> Yes, because the state is the violent. Police. Yeah. They're afraid of the... Yeah, yeah. Well, in China, they're there to serve you. And there's a huge respect. They need, people need the police. And they're very respected because they're there. They are a civil servant. Now, show me some videos of police brutality. If they are, they've been sanctioned by with penalties. And, and the guy lost the job or at worst, he's, he got to jail. Well, you know, you see... Uh, again, I'm not saying that China is good, the West is bad. I'm, I just want to state the facts. I state the facts, and then you make your own opinions. Yeah. I thought this isn't a question, but it's a good point. Um, if you're a journalist, your rights and freedoms aren't guaranteed in the U.S. Free Assange. Absolutely. Think about this. Absolutely. The U.S. is... What, what the U.S. is doing in China, and this is what a lot of people... And I, I understand they don't have time to look into it, and they fall for it, and they're their upbringing and everything around them has pointed them in this direction. So I, I really don't blame them that much for it. I wish they would start thinking for themselves. If you're going to look, if you don't have time for politics, don't do politics. You want to do politics, find the time to look into the rest of the story. Don't just believe stuff you see on the internet. Uh, th they'll say, hey, this journalist in China got arrested for reporting something about COVID. When you look into her background, she's one of these U.S. funded agitators. That's she's She's doing something in China that if someone was being funded by China to do in the United States, you would round them up and throw them in jail for treason. Uh, then at the radio, same time, she was Radio Free Asia, right? She was from Radio Free Asia. Well, there was I mean, one from. Funded. There was one from. There was one from Radio Free Asia. There was another one from like Epoch Times, and you know, there's like yeah, a whole I mean, network is, of them. 
look at the funding. This is uh, Radio Fiji Asia, also epoch time, epoch time. Yeah. You know, it's a uh, Falun Gong, it's uh, it's um, um, a technology fund, uh, open technology fund, which is funded oh, yeah, by yeah, USAGM. Yeah. US and then USAGM, yeah. the propaganda arm of the US, is funding Radio Free Asia. So you see, they're working as agents, agents, you know. Yeah. So Not this is why this, absolutely, you know. So, so there's that, and then look at Julian Assange, who is not a, yeah. it's not an agent for another state. He's publishing things that are absolutely true. Because another one of the the things I want to point out is that these U.S. government funded agitators here in Thailand, in China, elsewhere, not only are they taking U.S. government money, but they are lying. They are lying about things. They are promoting violence and division and sedition. Julian Assange was pointing out things that were 100% true. There was nothing that he ever said that people proved was untrue. Uh, there's another, there's another, uh, what Daniel, Daniel Hale. He was the American who exposed the U.S. drone warfare program and how mostly it was killing civilians. He is rotting in jail right now. That is what the U.S. is doing. Then they're projecting onto China this thing that they themselves are doing they're claiming that China is doing it, but that is not what China is doing. They are rounding up U.S. government-funded agitators and putting them in jail where they belong. Uh, you're in another country taking foreign money, and you're trying to divide and destroy society. Yeah, you don't you don't have the freedom to do that. I'm sorry, you don't. Uh, so mm. there, there's China is not perfect. They have issues. The people in China are more than capable to speak up about it and address it on their own. They don't need some white guy. From the other side of the planet to teach them how to run their own affairs uh, and so i i think that's why angelo you talk about it a lot i talk about it a lot we're, we're not picking sides we just want everyone to respect national sovereignty i believe in the primacy of national sovereignty no other country should be dictating to another country what they can and cannot do how to run their internal political affairs if you're not bothering anyone else around the world, then it's not it's not your business. And, and I, I think that's the, the bottom line, especially with China. Uh, you know, I think we could do a whole episode examining the psychology of Westerners who cannot accept the fact that China is surpassing them. Uh, but yeah, maybe that that's another topic for another time. I think we got all the questions. Angela, you got any closing thoughts you want to share? Just, just a closing thought, and this will be for Assange. I think... Uh... We will live this uh, time of history with a huge shame when we look back at uh, the collective West allowing Assange to be jailed and to, I mean, it's extremely inhumane conditions. Uh, Assange is in jail for us. He has forfeited his freedom for us, for all freedom. What he has done is just unique. Because of what he did, we are actually able to expose uh, criminal activities of, of our states and he's in jail for that. So, you know, and, and, and I think he's an inspiration and, and we, we owe him a, a lot. And it, it's a huge shame. It's a huge shame. I, I don't know how we can look at ourselves in the in, in the mirror and call our society being democracy and a beacon of freedom and human yeah. rights. It's, it's, it, there's such an hypocrisy, really. Uh, there, there's so much. Uh, again, we, we we, when, when the collective West is going around the world trying to teach, you know, the same as, you know, they used to do in, when, when they were a big empire, uh, teach those civilization. But, you know, we have so much to solve in our own countries. Why don't we bring human rights in our own countries? Start from ourselves. You know, there's so much, yeah. you know, we'd be busy 100%. And this is actually, you know, when, where China is right and where the CPC is right, they're self-centered. What they they focusing on Chinese people, and that is what government should do. Focus on the well-being of of your own people, and and start wo stop working for the elites. You know the elites they don't care about countries. They don't, they don't care about citizens. You know it's about you know if the world crashes, they are going to get even richer. That's the system. That's how the the system works. You know, uh, so so we are full. You know we. When we, we support, you know, those regime change, we meddle into other countries, we support war and so on. Uh, we, we, we've been fooled on the first place. 
you know what how good is, is it doing now we sanctioning russia and and there's high inflation we're getting poor and poor in europe i mean is it i mean are you serious keep on supporting that i mean you're becoming poor and poor what good is it, good is it doing to you but on the contrary then you have the elite yeah. that is getting richer and richer yeah and it's just going to get worse if they decide to extend this over to china which uh, you know we've said many times we have warned many times that that is the plan and the uh, insanity that we saw surrounding this anti-russia push and this conflict over Ukraine, this is going to be 10 times worse when it comes to China, and it's going to infect and spread through Western society much faster and to a higher degree than what we saw. Uh, this, this Russophobia will look like a fond memory in comparison. And uh, we're just trying to warn people uh, that this, the solution is very difficult to arrive at because everyone needs to wake up. <laughs> they need to start, like you said, Angelo, investing in them in themselves and ignoring uh, all of these these causes that we're told to care about abroad. What about the United States infrastructure, healthcare, education? The fact that China is promoting harmony, social harmony across their massive population. The United States government and media is deliberately cultivating division among the American people. Think about that. Uh, that's that's where people in the West should be concerned not with China surpassing them. If anything, look to China as an example instead of as a threat. Uh, Angela, I want to thank you very much for joining me on this uh, Friday afternoon. I want to wish you and everyone who joined us a, a happy weekend. Uh, check the video description below for where you can find uh, my work elsewhere. And also Angela, he's on Twitter and YouTube. We don't do super chats. I don't monetize any of my YouTube videos. So if you want to support the new Atlas, just uh, check out the options available in the video description below. And until next time, bye for now.